On March 20, 2022, the Pacific Islands were hit with a diplomatic bombshell. Following secret negotiations, the Solomon Islands signed a security pact with China. Having long viewed the Pacific as its backyard, the deal caused disquiet in Canberra. The coalition government staked its election campaign on its national security credentials. These claims were now in tatters, and media reports drummed up the prospect of a Chinese naval base on Australia's doorstep. Only five months earlier, the Solomons had requested Canberra's help in quelling anti-government riots. Now, Beijing would be granted similar privileges. The developments signaled a new Pacific power struggle. So, on 21st May, upon being sworn in, Australia's new Prime Minister boarded a plane. On his itinerary was a series of diplomatic visits to strengthen regional ties. Simultaneously, China's top diplomat embarked on his own tour, visiting eight Pacific states in 10 days. So, why are China and Australia at odds, and what's behind their diplomatic scramble in the Pacific? Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. In times of conflict, geo-restrictions make some domains of cyberspace inaccessible. What happens is that governments activate national barriers to minimize their public's exposure to foreign influences. TikTok, Telegram, Facebook, YouTube, and even Wikipedia are banned or closed in some countries. Now, all is fair in love and war, but that makes my job all the more difficult because regardless of the nature of the conflict, I still have to get my hands on data and intel from the opposite side to keep my content as objective as possible. This is where NordVPN comes into play. Using the app, I can digitally relocate to another country and bypass such national firewalls. It's an essential tool in my arsenal. What's more, no one, including ISP operators, can see what I'm up to, what data banks I'm accessing, or what papers I'm reading. So NordVPN strengthens my access to cyberspace, while at the same time ensuring a private web experience. These two principles, privacy and security, are now more important than ever. Use the link in the description to get an exclusive NordVPN deal, it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Three trends characterize Australian foreign policy. First, it will ally with the world's chief naval power to protect its maritime interests. Second, it will stay on the winning side of the global geopolitical struggle. Third, it will use the safety of isolation to engage in calculated and deliberate diplomacy. Since 1942, these principles have ensured Australian-US alignment, but the relationship is asymmetrical. Canberra needs Washington more than Washington needs it. As such, Australian policymakers promote their country's strategic weight by offering the United States a staging ground for Asia-Pacific policymaking. This relationship is bound together by the interoperability of capabilities and forces. The Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, ANZUS, Quad, AUKUS are but different layers within this larger security umbrella. Australia's unique location and geography yields many more advantages. For instance, the Pine Gap facility in the outback is crucial to American intelligence gathering by interception of signals. The base detects missiles, controls drones, intercepts transmissions across Eurasia, and talks to spy satellites in geosynchronous orbit. Meanwhile, the naval station at Northwest Cape beams data to US submarines. This allows American boats to tail Chinese nuclear submarines and sink them instantly should a war break out. The new AUKUS Pact, signed in 2021, will expand interoperability further, providing Australia with nuclear submarines, cyber capabilities and hypersonic missiles. Washington thus assumes responsibility for Australia's defense. 
but the price Canberra must pay in return is to subordinate itself to American grand strategy. Cultural affinity makes Australia's junior partner status easier to swallow. But while leaders sing the tune of shared Western values, the alliance's underlying base note is cold realism. This is why Australia takes a confrontational stance towards China. Some argue that Canberra's policy undermines Australia's economic interests, since China is its largest trading partner. But this too misunderstands how Canberra perceives its economic interests. Firstly, much of Australia's China-bound trade consists of minerals, which account for two-thirds of export income. This demand is generated by China's construction industry, especially iron ore, a crucial component in steel. On an annual base, Australia produces 900 million tons of iron ore, more than double that of second-placed Brazil. And since there are no significant alternative suppliers, Australian mining companies are convinced that Chinese demand will persist in the face of geopolitical tensions. Secondly, Canberra's perception of its economic interests is shaped by lobbying. Given China's economic weight, one would assume businesses would push for good relations with Beijing. But as of 2019, 15 of the top 20 companies listed on the Australian Securities Exchange were majority American-owned including four of the five mining companies. The holders of equity determine corporate policy and priorities. Thus, in practice, lobbying fuses together Australian and American economic interests. Canberra's role within Washington's security umbrella has led its neighbors to label it America's deputy sheriff, or lapdog. Yet, this is only half the equation. And while the American alliance helps ensure Australia's survival, survival is not at all it is interested in. Since the 19th century, Australia's maritime alliances have granted a free hand in the Pacific, from the cotton crops of Fiji to the phosphate mines of Nauru to the gold and copper pits of New Guinea. The Pacific region is a profitable destination for Australian businesses. And since Canberra relies on its companies to obtain tax revenue, it is duty-bound to ensure a stable investment climate. Sometimes this means direct military and policing interventions. No doubt, these missions often have a genuine humanitarian purpose, but once the guns fall silent, the first order of business is business. For example, following East Timor's declaration of independence in 1999, Australia dispatched forces to quell pro-Indonesian militia violence. The intervention saved countless lives, but once the dust settled, Australia used its leverage to strong-arm East Timor out of its share of the Greater Sunrise oil field. Likewise, ethnic violence moved Canberra to intervene in the Solomon Islands in 2003, in a mission that would last 14 years. Canberra took over law enforcement, finance and other government functions. When the intervention ended, a bilateral security treaty was signed allowing Australian personnel to enter the Solomon Islands upon Honiara's request and use force to protect Australian assets. Ergo, for Australia, China's inroads into the Pacific are an encroachment on its turf. And like Australia, Beijing has both strategic and economic interests at play. Strategically, China wants to puncture Washington's containment ring along the first island chain. Economically, Beijing is looking for profitable investments and the means to secure them. For this, China has sought access to airfields and ports in Kiribati, Vanuatu and French Polynesia. It has also forged police and military links in Fiji, Papua New Guinea and Tonga. But any Chinese move is met by an Australian countermove, and this jostle for power manifests in unusual ways. One example came in August 2017, when the Solomon Islands tried to contract Huawei to build an undersea internet cable to Sydney, Australia's spy agency vetoed the deal. 
The fear was that Beijing could use cable infrastructure to spy on internet traffic. Accordingly, Canberra stepped in to build the cable itself. And in 2020, it joined forces with Tokyo and Washington to build a similar cable to Palau. Likewise, in 2019, when Papua New Guinea sought Beijing's help refinancing its debts, Canberra responded with a loan package worth $302 million, though the terms of the deal were kept secret. That same year, Canberra unveiled a response plan to China's Belt and Road Initiative. The Pacific Step Up program pledged to promote sovereignty, stability, security, and prosperity in the region. This included $1 billion in aid, a $1.4 billion infrastructure financing facility for the Pacific, and a labor mobility scheme allowing Pacific and Timorese nationals to work in Australia. Beyond this, Canberra created a Pacific Security College to train police and military personnel. Finally, Australia gave its telecom company Telstra $1.3 billion to purchase Digicel Pacific, a mobile phone carrier active in six regional markets. Meanwhile, Beijing's Digital Silk Road set up Pacific ground stations for its Baidu satellite navigation system. Like its American equivalent, GPS, Baidu can be used as a guidance system for missiles and weapon delivery systems. Policing, infrastructure and telecommunications have thus become key battlegrounds in the Pacific power struggle. Still, it would be wrong to assume the Pacific Islands as passive players on a geopolitical chessboard. Far from it. Balancing China against Australia grants the Pacific nations significant leverage in ensuring favorable outcomes. For example, climate change has long been a thorny issue in the region, not least because Australia's coalition government took a dismissive stance on the issue. Kiribati is the Pacific nation with the lowest GDP per capita and is greatly affected by rising sea levels. As such, in 2022, the country signed 10 deals with China and withdrew from the Australian-dominated Pacific Islands Forum. Thereafter, Canberra's new Labour government signed an emissions reduction bill into power, hoping that such measures would prevent other Pacific nations from switching camps. East Timor, meanwhile, is seeking for a better deal for its greater Sunrise oil field. The current plan is for a gas pipeline to run to Darwin in North Australia. Dili, however, wants it to run to Timor since the processing facilities will stimulate investments in infrastructure and jobs. Negotiations are ongoing and East Timor's new president has cautioned to seek Chinese support if Dili does not get its way. Even so, Beijing's influence in the region is limited to bilateral ties and its attempts to promote a region-wide economic security pact have thus far stalled. For now, the Solomon Islands remains the main thorn in Australia's side. In November 2021, Haniera's decision to switch diplomatic recognition from Taiwan to China provoked riots in the capital. The reason was that the Solomon Island of Malaita was dependent on Taiwanese aid, which would now be cut off. Though Australia sent forces to quell the violence, it did little to protect Chinese investments and property. As such, Haniara's Chinatown district was largely destroyed. Fearing such actions would deter investors, the Sino-Solomon security deal, signed in March 2022, allows Beijing to dispatch its own security personnel to secure its interests. The agreement protects Chinese mining, logging, and commercial activities. It also grants the Chinese Navy access to refueling facilities. This was then followed by an announcement that Huawei would build 161 new mobile towers on Solomon territory. And on August 29, Hanueru further upped the ante by denying maritime access to a US Coast Guard ship. This was followed by a blanket ban on foreign naval vessels. For the long-neglected Solomon Islanders, the goal is to extract concessions from Australia and the West. And though Haniera insists Australia is its security partner of choice, it has also said it will look for Chinese help to fill any gaps. 
ultimately protecting Australia's security and economic interests is a job too big for the deputy sheriff. And there are signs Washington is stepping into the breach. The US is expanding its defense facilities on Guam, Tinian and Wake Island and is deepening ties to Papua New Guinea and Micronesia. Joe Biden has also invited the Pacific leaders to a meeting at the end of September, a measure that shows the increased importance of the region to Washington's anti-China containment strategy. For the moment, the balancing act is paying off for some of the Pacific nations, but the potential dangers of this strategy may yet reveal themselves. As time wears on, the avenues for conflict between Chinese and Western interests will only multiply. Thus, each step must be attended with caution, and each act of charity must be viewed with utmost suspicion. Manipulation is the name of the game, and anything that is manipulatable is rarely yours to keep. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Special thanks to Anton Murrell for researching this topic. And if you want to help out, leave a like, comment and subscribe. Thank you for watching and Saul. So